Hi everyone, I'm going to have a chat about tonsils because there's so many recurring conversations that I have with families. I think it's, it's just helpful to get a few things clarified. So, number one, in terms of the reason that paediatric ear, nose and throat doctors take out tonsils, the leading indication is obstruction. It's not tonsillitis. It's not infection. That's number two. Number one is obstruction. So often parents uh, think that uh, the kid needs to have tonsillitis to take them out. It's, it's simply not the case. Most of the children that I fix have not got a significant history of tonsillitis at all. So first thing, uh, tonsillitis, second on the list, not number one. Number one, by and far, is obstruction. And obstruction can be snoring, mouth breathing, uh, sleep apnea where they stop breathing at night, for example. And there's plenty of videos I've posted about those topics, so I don't want to go over that. Number two, they'll outgrow it. Now, this is a fallacy based on some flawed science. There is some research that dates back around about 80, 90 years ago that showed the tonsils and adenoids getting smaller. That actually wasn't research on the tonsils and adenoids. That was research on the lymph gland tissue, of which tonsils and adenoids are part of it. But the research was never on that tissue. Now, um, that research has been done subsequently. And yes, we do know, for example, that the adenoids get smaller over time. So you go, well, why would you want to take them out? It's because normal adenoids get smaller over time. Normal adenoids are not big adenoids causing airway obstruction. So already we've got a problem with the misuse of information in the wrong clinical setting. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the, they'll outgrow it. And, and that's based on the interpretation of some research which predominantly relates to sleep study results. So there's some big uh, research papers. Uh, one is called CHAT which is an acronym for Childhood Adenotonsillectomy. And it was a study in the USA where they looked at, let's fix half the kids with surgery and let's leave the other half alone and let's measure their sleep study results. And what they found is if you didn't uh, do surgery, okay, um, half the children would end up with a normal sleep study. So you go, wow, that's great. Um, we don't need to do as much surgery as we think. That was part of the story. The other part of the story then was to say, well, of those kids, um, they've got normal sleep studies, how many of those kids are actually doing okay now? The answer was not very many. And this is because of the flaws of measuring breathing and sleeping kids relying on sleep studies. They don't pick up all the types of breathing problems. So you could have a child that is snoring but doesn't have sleep apnea but that snoring is a sign of a breathing problem which reflects that on low oxygen levels, which can affect their brain. And that's what they were finding. They found that children that had had surgery, that their mental capacity and function was so much better than those children that hadn't had the surgery. And they also found that having uh, a normal or an abnormal sleep study actually didn't mean anything as to who would get better or not in the first place. So it really came down to a clinical assessment. So think of it this way. For example, if you break an arm, but in the process of breaking your arm, one of the nerves near the bone also gets injured and it causes paralysis in that limb. We could do an X-ray that shows that the fracture has healed and go, hey, look, this fracture got better, but we need to look at the big picture this person still can't walk or still can't use their arm because the nerve was damaged and that limb is paralyzed. So this is the important thing of, you've got to look at the clinical picture, not the test results. So the research has shown um, if you want to misappropriate the findings, that if you do nothing, that a lot of children will outgrow uh, their sleep study result. But in the process, they have ongoing problems. And we've got a lot of research research now showing, for example, that these children have a tendency to having high blood pressure when they're older, having problems with attention uh, and concentration and behaviour when they're older, having problems uh, with uh, memory um, and, and, and those sorts of things too, and also having problems with the way that the heart works. Uh, there's a whole range of health problems that knock on even once the breathing seems to get better. And this is the important thing about surgery too, is that the better results we get for the longevity of, of, of kids 
is getting that surgery done early, not late. It, it's not a matter of, oh, it's okay, we can get around to it. It's, no, your child cannot breathe properly at night. This just became one of the most important health conditions your child may experience, and it needs to be treated promptly. You need to do the best you can to get them in and get them fixed. And, and you need to overcome your fears and overcome your anxieties about what's involved and find someone that you have faith, trust and confidence in that you believe can give you the uh, safe journey through what um, you know can be a, a concerning process. And I, I don't want to pretend that there's not risks involved. You know, we don't have complacency about this. So you, you want to find someone that's, that's, that's experienced and, and skilled with, with managing these problems, working with children, and also, of course, working with the parents that come with the children too. It's our job to look after you guys as, as part of the process. So anyway, that's, that's it in a nutshell. That I, I really just thought I'd just get a few things out there just so that people can understand this situation better because there's so many uh, misconceptions and uh, misunderstandings that I hope this will help uh, people um, you know, move forwards with things. Cheers.